There she is. Hi, David. I love, I just saw you dancing on Instagram. How did that yeah. feel to be dancing across New York Street on the CBS lot? I know, you know, it was so crazy because literally last week and, and actually for a couple of weeks, I've been missing dancing so much. And I had a girlfriend who came over and she's very spiritual and she did a sound bath with me. And after the sound bath ended, she goes, Amanda, Nick wants you to dance. He wants you to have fun. He wants, like, he's showing me you dancing. And I literally, like, started crying because I was like, Siobhan, I have been missing dancing so much. And I've been going to this fake street at the CBS lot and just dancing around because I want to, like, dance again. And she was like, well, he sees you and he wants you to dance again. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like it was just bonkers this stuff keeps happening to me though it's like it's crazy he's here he's around well for everyone who doesn't know nick cordero was a broadway actor a canadian he met uh, the love of his life this beautiful woman right here who by the way is from the midwest ohio uh they met on broadway it was called bullets over broadway she was a dancer he was an actor she by the way we're not talking about any dancer we're talking about a rockette we're talking about like <laughs> you know, the, the, the big time dancer. And so they met, they fell in love and they have together a beautiful uh, young son, Elvis. Um, I would love to start off this conversation by asking you to finish this sentence. Oh. For me, Nick Cordero was... Oh my gosh. Um... I mean, that's, it's going to be a run-on sentence, David. <laughs> Run on, boo. For me, Nick Cordero was my best friend, um, my soulmate in a lot of ways, love of my life, and um, just an, an, incredible, uh, an incredible man who I learned from every day, which I think, uh, you know, true love, you keep learning every day, you know? Nick died uh, after multiple complications from coronavirus. And for those of you who don't know, Nick went into the hospital. They thought it was pneumonia. He and Amanda were out here on the West Coast. He went to Cedar sinai And he had this months-long battle with this virus as we as a country, as a world, as a people, were learning what it was about. And this was in the very beginning of um, the pandemic. And so Amanda became very vocal on social media. It's how I first found out about Amanda. It's quite honestly how I first found out about Nick. Me and my colleagues were following uh, their story. And you, uh, you know, I was globe trotting, not globe trotting, but I was trotting across the country, Amanda, when nobody else was really traveling, covering, covering coronavirus and all the various hotspots. And I would check into your social media and I often wondered what it was that gave you the courage and quite frankly, the conviction to be so open about what you were going through on social media. You know, I think you learn so much in retrospect um, because I have to say when everything was happening, it, it was so, um, it was so crazy, obviously. But now that I look at it in retrospect, I look at it as I think it was because it was as if I was going to therapy every day. Mm. I had so much that I was dealing with on a daily basis and doctor's phone calls and being a mom and my family and um, Nick's family and just trying to process it all that when I would go on Instagram and talk, it was as if I was talking to a therapist because obviously, mm. you know, when you're saying something on a story, no one's talking back to you, right? Until right. you press send and then, then the whole world, you know, would respond. But that response actually really helped to fuel um, my energy and my hope and my resilience. And, um, and I think that's why I, it was able, I was able to keep going. You know, it all started in the beginning by just helping people to stay aware because it was so crazy what was happening. Perfectly healthy 41 year old man um, had no symptoms of coronavirus and then he's in the ICU. So in the beginning, it was more so just being like, this is happening. This could also happen to you, just FYI, you know? Um, and then it just kept snowballing. And, um, you know, David, I don't know. I mean, we haven't known each other a long time, but I, 
I hope you got the feeling that I'm, I'm an honest person, you know, like I, I have, I share, I share things. I try, I, I try and I like to help people. So um, I think that's where it came from. Amanda, I know you are. I spent just a week with you and there is, <laughs> there's a bright light to you, but there is just an infectious sincerity. Oh, thank you. That's how I would describe it. Do you mind if I read some parts of the book as we go along? No. And you can, you can, you can jump in. So Amanda, in the very beginning of the book, everyone details what it was like to be a wife, basically at home. She's getting every update over the phone. Remember, no one is allowed in the hospital. You can't go in somebody's room. And she describes the hospital. Uh, I I'm going to read this portion. Nick had been admitted to the ICU put on a ventilator and placed in a medically induced coma. He had tested positive for COVID-19, gotten an infection, gone into septic shock, died for two minutes on the table, been resuscitated, put on a machine called uh, ECMO, which we can describe, I'll, I'll describe later, uh, to save his life. And then he'd gotten a blood clot in his right leg. The machine that saves you can also destroy you. She said, and, and you later write, now I had to make a choice when they were talking to you about amputating his leg, but there was no real choice to make. It was his leg or it was his life. I chose life. Talk to me about those decisions that you had to make regularly where they call and go, Amanda, we can do A or B. It's your decision. The, 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 the emotion of you being the one to say yes or no. Yeah. Um, which is also crazy because David, I had never had anyone that I know or love in the ICU. So I did not know these ICU protocols. You know, I, honestly, the only hospital experience I've ever had is me giving birth to Elvis. So I was so green. I didn't know what I could ask the nurses and doctors. I didn't, you know, they were saying terms and I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know what was good and what was bad. Um, so when they call you and they say, you know, can you give your consent? You're like, well, what? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anything about what you're talking about. I have to know and trust you guys. But also you're like, do I give my consent? You know, like, am I, I have to say yes or no for my husband right now. I would call Nick's mom a lot. And Nick's mom, who's possibly one of the strongest women I know, woman I know, she said to me always, Amanda, I trust you. I trust you. Whatever you think is best, I trust you. And so, I mean, But that's still was. such a ginormous responsibility, Amanda. It's literally you, not even yeah. in consultation with Nick. Oh, yeah. And a lot of these phone calls came at like 2 a.m. in the middle of the night. The phone would ring. I'd be in bed with Elvis because we still close slept at that time. And the phone, I was holding always the phone in my hand. And the phone would ring. And my heart would leap out of my chest because everything seemed to always happen bad at night. And the phone would ring. And I'd get on the phone. And they would be like, we need your consent to, you know, put Nick on dialysis right now. And you're just like, well, obviously, yes. I mean, I don't know what, you know, you, you don't know. You have to trust these incredible doctors at Cedar sinai Hospital, which I did. I trusted them explicitly, but you're right. Still that decision of, it's my decision right now, yes or no, to say leg or life or this or that is intense. You write in the book, um, I, I do love this line, all Nick wanted to be was a dad. All Nick wanted to be was a dad. You, you write about having to go and sign a document, right? And they, they say to you, you have to come to the hospital. And you're like, oh, okay. And so you grab everything, you dress Elvis, you get in the car. And you describe running to the room, room 602. And you write, standing next to the glass, looking in, I couldn't believe it was real. I never felt so sick or helpless in my life that my husband was in there, my husband. I couldn't hug him, I couldn't comfort him, I couldn't pray with him or tell him how much I loved him. And then you describe the nurses and the doctors going in and out and you're outside the glass. You're outside the glass and every time the door opens and closes, you yell, I love you, Nick, it's Amanda, honey, I'm here. There, 
that really is your only way of getting close to him physically. Well, it was crazy because he was still in his coma. And so I was getting so much help from people on Instagram saying, um, this is what you do when you have someone in a coma. They can hear you. They can hear. But when you talk to them, you have to command. You have to say things in a very commanding, direct voice. Mm. Um, and it has to be like very loud and commanding. So that day in particular, David, when I saw him, I, you know, they, they weren't letting me in, like you said. And so I was shouting uh, and as loud as I possibly could. I didn't even care if the nurses and doctors thought I was crazy. But I was, yeah, I was shouting, I'm here. Wait, I wake up because we were, that was still when Nick needed to wake up. So, um, it, I mean, honestly, I'll never forget that day. It was, uh, it was definitely probably the worst slash hardest day of my life. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it was tough, but it was, it lit literally just, it was, it's all I could do. It's all I could do is shout commanding, you know, words to Nick from afar. While we were, you know, again, I'm speaking from my own experience of covering this, you know, every other week there was some, you know, whether it was hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir or the platelets thing they were giving you write in the book about Nick being eligible and them talking to you about giving him remdesivir. And you write every time they called me to ask my consent, my stomach dropped. I always trusted the doctor's opinion and I wanted to do what the medical team felt was best. But having to be the one to make that choice every time was scary. Yeah. Did it get easier after a while? Um, I don't think it ever got easier. I would say I got maybe a little bit more confident because mm. I, you know, by the, by the time Nick passed, I, I could have, I thought, you know, thought, I could join the medical team. You know, that's where I was at. I was literally like, I knew all the terms. I knew all the numbers. I knew where they needed to be. I mean, you could have put me in coach. I was like ready to go. I, it was, you know, that's how deep into like medical terms I was. Um, so I think I just got more confident. I was, I just felt like I knew what was going on. Um, and I, and I, I, I was, I was more able to say yes, absolutely. Or, wait a second, can I sort of understand why you're making, why you're asking me to do this or what, you know? And then there were a couple of times, David, where I literally like held my ground and I said, absolutely not to a couple of things too. So, um, what were those things? Um, I talk about it in the book, but it's mostly okay. when they were, con uh, when they were, you know, there was a lot of times that they told me Nick was going to die and I said, absolutely not. So you'll read that and you know, this, then the story, but it, those were, those were the, the biggest times for Tell sure. Tell me this, were you able to face, so Nick, from what I read, you dropped him off at Cedars and he walked himself in, right? Were, how many phone calls and or FaceTimes were you able to have with him after that point? He, we talked to each other a couple of times that day and then um, we FaceTimed, but he was, it was so crazy. You know, looking back, you're like, why, why weren't we talking more? But like, I literally thought he's going to be home in a couple hours. You know what I mean? Like I, we did not think he had this. Um, and even when I was FaceTiming him, his oxygen levels were so low. I distinctly remember a conversation going, honey, I don't think you should be talking right now. I think like you should really just kind of rest and focus on I feel like in talking, it's it's like you're um you you're having a hard time breathe. I don't I, I don't think you should be talking right now. Um, and I said that because I like I said I literally thought he would be home, you know, in a day or two or or a couple out, you know, like we weren't we weren't thinking. I, I definitely wasn't thinking anything that was about to happen was going to happen, you know. And I and and he just, yeah, he literally was like out of oxygen. It was, his lungs were so bad at that point now that I can, now I can understand where he was at at that point at the time I did it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know, David, maybe, maybe 10 times we texted a lot, you know, we, we texted a lot and, uh, and every time we called it, he, he barely could get two minutes out on the phone without having like breathing problems. 
Amanda, what do you say to people who say, oh, well, he had pre-existing conditions and that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be very honest with you. I uh, have struggled for the last year um, because I have to talk to people on both sides of the spectrum, those who believe the science and those who don't. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to someone the other day and she said, well, give me an example. And I sent Nick's, I sent Nick's story. Mm -hmm. And her response to me was, well, he had pre-existing conditions. <laughs> he didn't, did he? No, no. So what do you do? You are a widow. You went through it. You lived it. Do you get enraged by that? Um, I don't get enraged because I kind of... Um... I just honestly, David, I just look at that as um, a bit of ignorance and I can only, I can only tell our story. I've told a very honest, never went to the doctor. He, um, he, he, he was never sick. He, he was so, he was such a healthy man and exercised daily and, and took care of himself, ate well. Um, so if you want to believe still that he had pre-existing health conditions, there's nothing else I can tell you. I, I uh, a part of me feels feels bad for those people that can't um, hear. It's a, it's that's that's sad to me. I agree. I'd like to read uh, another portion of the book that I had um, underlined. It was you talk about a moment where I took a photo of Nick to send to his family, and it shocked even me. And you write that there were some there were some bed sores um, on uh, one particularly on on his tailbone. And you write that I had the option of staying while they examined it. As they pulled the blankets off of Nick and turned his body onto its side, I almost fainted. His amputated leg had no muscle tone, and it just flopped over to the side. His bones were protruding out of his skin. I hadn't seen Nick's whole body since he had been admitted to the hospital, and I was shocked. What was that like for you as you just over the several weeks, 12 or so that you were there, um, watched the body deteriorate because of this virus? It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Um, I'll never forget, honestly, I'll never forget that day because, um, you know, I, I definitely went into fighter mode through this whole thing, right? I mean, I think we can yeah. say that. Yeah. And I had rose colored glasses on. There are many a times that Nick's main doctor was like, you know, everyone here at the hospital thinks you're crazy, right? <laughs> um, because I just, I, I had so much hope, but I remember that day um, seeing Nick's body and how much weight he had lost. And I was very concerned. I thought, how do you come back from this? Because the, he was in such a state and, and I knew what, I knew what he would have to climb in order to even sit up again, like not even, not even stand on an amputated leg with, um, with the um, prosthetic. Uh, I mean, that was, uh, that would have been years. It would have probably taken Nick years. Um, his body got so frail and he lost so much weight. It was, it you know, you, you can't, you can't heal unless your body has the ability, the strength to do it, you know? So I knew being a fitness professional, what, what that was going to, to take. And it, and it even defeated me that day seeing, seeing him, even for that bed sort of heal, he has to, he, he has to be able to move his own body. He has to be able to sit up. He would have had to be, be able to stand in order for that bed sore to heal. So I even knew like looking at him that day, like how, how do we how do we even get that to heal because he can't he can't even open his eyes he doesn't even have the strength to open his eyes so um that was that was a very very hard day i got very uh into um physical therapy and talking to the doctors about his nutrition and i was very very uh you know i got very adamant about that and him gaining calories because you know he was six foot five walked into the hospital at 225 pounds when he passed away. I think he was 148 pounds. Um, so he was very, very, very thin and frail and weak. And, um, and I knew what that was, you know what I mean? I knew, I knew that that was, that was going to be a very hard, hard thing. 
And I We're never talking. shared those photos. I don't think I ever will. Um, but they are in my phone. And when I look at them now, I, I honestly can't believe, you know, like it's one of those things where I can't believe um, how, how your body can change, right? How in 18 days your body can change, how in two months your body can change, how in three months your body can change. Um, and you, you watch that happen to somebody and David, you're, you're forever changed. You forever look at health and fitness a different way. You forever look at the ability to just, the ability to raise your arms. You know what I mean? It, it's, it, it changes you 100%. Did, did it change your faith in any way? No. In fact, um, ironically, and I say ironically because seriously, ironically, my faith got stronger. My faith my belief in God and his, um, his power of watching over us got stronger. I've never felt more close to my faith and God than I did during those three months. Um, never. Oh, my God. There were days I was in there and I just, I felt, I felt God with us. I really did. I, it, it only made it stronger. You are Catholic. Is that correct? Lutheran, grew up Lutheran. Lutheran, Lutheran. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why I thought Catholic. Catholic. <laughs> I am Catholic. Is it true that Nick died on Good Friday? He died for two minutes on Good Friday. Okay, but that was not okay. God, so for for two minutes, that was the yeah. Um, and they resuscitated him, and they put him on the ECMO machine to save his life. At the top of chapter nineteen, um, you write something that I highlighted. Quote: As the week went on the option of comfort care loomed over Leslie and me. But the thought of it was so painful, we wouldn't even discuss it out loud. I begged and pleaded with God each day, if you are going to take Nick, please don't make us make that choice. Yeah, I didn't want to have to make that choice. Uh, that was my prayer every day. And you know, you, you asked me about faith. I will tell you there were many a times I would come home from the hospital and I would look at my mom and dad and I would be like, where is God right now? Why isn't he answering any of my prayers? Like, what is happening? Like, what? And I would cry and, and you know, I keep asking for a miracle. And where is our miracle? And, um, and, and this uh, was another prayer that I prayed every single day because... Um, I, again, never heard of comfort care. Um, and when the doctors first presented it to us, it was in May and um, last, you know, last year at this time. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. I saw a man that was fighting every single day. And I saw, I saw Nick fighting. I knew he was fighting. I could feel it. I could see it a lot of times. Um, I knew he wasn't giving up. And so I wasn't going to give up. Behind you in your dressing room is a really, really great photo. Of, I know it's hard for everyone to see, but why don't you describe it, the middle photo? Yeah, I'll show it. Let's see. Can you see it? The little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this a light. Is, uh, describe yeah, it. the light. I don't know if you can. There it is. There it is. Yeah. So um, there's Nick with baby Elvis and the little whatever you call that. Yeah, the baby Bjorn. I love <laughs> this photo so much because, um, A, Nick is so happy you can tell he's a proud papa this was on our way to one of elvis's i think i think it was his first or second um checkup um it was a beautiful new york city day um and i just remember like the whole thing i remember him being so proud and so happy and so um you know, protective over Elvis and um, wanting to just like make sure, you know, no, no, not even a speck of New York City dust got in his little face. And, um, and we went to Central Park afterwards, I remember and had a little picnic. And so this that picture, I just like, you know, so many pictures can or, or a song can just like, literally like bring you, you know, back to a moment and in a time and you can paint the whole picture. And I look at that picture and I know what I was wearing. I know what we did that day. I know what we ate that day. And I, I remember Nick being so happy and fulfilled in, um, and in 
So yeah, it's blown up. This next question I'm about to ask you, I want to tell the audience, Amanda and I have already discussed this, so I know it's something she is both comfortable answering and discussing. But when I walked in your dressing room and I saw that photo, it gave me all the feels. And then I thought, can you love again? And what does that love look like as you look forward to loving a man, but raising a son who that will always be his father? Tell, tell everyone what you have thought, at least allow yourself to think about that so far. Yeah, um, listen, I know that if Nick could have spoke when he passed away, he would have said to me, you better get married again. You better find an amazing man to spend the rest of your life with and to help you raise Elvis. And I would have said the exact same thing to him. If the tables were turned, I would have looked in his eyes and I would have said, Nick, you find love again. Do not let this take you down. Um, having said that, uh, finding that I think is going to be very hard. I will be very honest. I am terrified about it, you know, but um, I don't want to be alone for the rest of my life. Um, But David, gosh, he's got to be really good. He's got to be really special. So I'm not in any rush. If it happens right away, I will welcome it. If it takes me 10 years, I will welcome it. Um, there's amazing people like Katie Couric who have uh, given me ex an amazing advice about finding love again. And, and Katie was so cute. She was like, I loved dating. Dating was so fun. I really liked being out there again. And I was like, Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and she, and then, you know, I, I took Elvis to a uh, preschool tour and the, the preschool, uh, owner of the preschool is a widow with a child and she was like I got married again and we celebrate our people and we celebrate our birthdays and we celebrate our anniversaries and so I think that's beautiful um I I, I look forward to it I think what I'll ask is um is a little bit of grace from the world and I and I mm -hmm. that sounds like a big thing but um I know a lot of people are close to this story and a lot of people are close to Nick and I's love story. No one was, no one's closer to it than me, trust me. Um, but I just hope people are generous uh, and, and graceful to me when this starts happening because I, you know, for instance, I posted a photo of Elvis having, Elvis and I having dinner and um, there was a martini on the table, which was Elvis, my, my friend's martini, my girlfriend's martini. And there were already comments like, are you secretly dating somebody? Do you have a man already? Are you seeing somebody? It's not even been a year. And there was all of these, yes, there was all of these like really hard comments to read about if that would have been a man that I might be seeing. And I just was like, wow, really guys? Like, so I just asked for some grace because this will be, really hard on me and it'll be really hard to find somebody again i think and i i hope it's not but like it, i i'm imagining it's not going to be easy to fall in love again and find somebody that's like i want you know to help me raise elvis with so i asked for some grace just because i think the stereotype for a, a woman to find another man again is um is different than if it's a single father uh, I think the single fathers, so you got to go back out there and you got to find yourself a wife. And I think it's important to let a woman also go back out there and find a husband. And it doesn't mean I don't love Nick anymore. It doesn't mean that I don't wish he was here. I want, I wish nothing more than I had Nick every day, you know, but that's, that's not my option anymore. So, you know, that was a long winded answer for your question. <laughs> I want to be I want to be clear. There was an intention behind that question. And the intention was not to suggest that you fall in love today, tomorrow or a year from now. It was actually to make myself feel better. Because when I looked at that photo, I just didn't want people to forget about Nick. And I thought, can you find a relationship where the other person is okay 
celebrating Nick's birthday, talking about Nick, laughing about Nick, having photos of Nick around the house. Like I wanted that for you. And I think I'm admitting that because everyone who has watched your story feels a sense of connection to you and to Nick, a little bit of ownership. And when I walked in there, that's what I felt. It was me being like, whoever she loves next, I just want him to be okay with Nick having a space in that relationship. Yeah. Well, I, I hope so too, because, you know, Nick is so much a part of my life and Elvis's life, obviously. And I don't ever want that to go away. I, I want him to be so close to his father, as close as he possibly can. I want him to be so close with the Corderos. I want us to stay close to the Corderos. Um, they're an incredible family. They love family. They love Elvis so much. They love me so much. So I don't ever want that to go away. And you know, I'll tell you, David, I've been through a divorce too. And it's different when you start dating again after a divorce. It's different because a divorce ends and you're kind of like, you know, okay, good riddance, goodbye. I want a new face, right? Um, with a death, you're sitting across the table from someone and you're like, I, I, I just want my person back, you know? Like, I, I don't, you know, that's, that's what's hard. It's like, you just, you, you have to get over that. And, and, and I, I will, I'll get over that. Um, because a good friend of mine who lost his wife, he told me, so he reminded me, he goes, Amanda, that's option A, but we, you know, this is back to Cheryl Sandberg's book, option B. You're, you have to have option B now because option A is gone. So option B is, is what has to be, you know? So we'll see. I think it'll be, um, it'll be a big hurdle. I think I'm not putting any timeline on it. You know, we, we have this book launch and then next anniversary is July 5th. And I hope to take some time after that to just kind of like decompress. And then, you know, maybe I'll, I'll start trying to. The book is live your life. My story of living, of loving and losing Nick Cordero. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, David. I love you. Miss you. <laughs> Bye-bye. I love you too. Thanks for doing <laughs> this. And thanks everyone for watching. Thanks. Bye -bye.